Good morning. My name is Jane Heron, and the topic this morning is the mirror of your mind, the mirror of your life. And mirroring is something that has been real familiar to me because of the way I came into this world, which I think is a little differently than probably about 99% of most of you got so familiar with mirroring, is because a miracle which only God can perform. And that miracle is called cell division. And that miracle took place in the fall of 53. And because of cell division, I had an unusual opportunity to have a womb mate for nine full months. It was really wonderful because I had the opportunity to experience advanced intimacy, advanced communication skills, and understanding what it meant to live in a very small, dark place for nine full months. It was an unusual experience to have a womb mate because I had an opportunity to have wonderful womb temperature, 98.6. <laughs> wonderful womb service, better than any hotel that I would actually go to. And uh, let's see, there kind of came a little bit of stress when my nine-month lease became to come to the end. And when that nine-month lease came to the end, the stress of knowing that I had to move was beginning to get overwhelming. I was getting a little pushed out of shape. I was hearing some heavy breathing. And all of a sudden, I decided that it was time to move out of darkness into lightness and discover who I really was, which I came out as a twin. Now, most identical twins, when the cell divides, is kind of interesting because in one out of a thousand, cell divides this way. And, it, and you have two lefties or you have two righties. With identical mirror twins, which is my sister and myself, the cell divides this way, which means you separate this way, and it was like living in an I Love Lucy film my entire life. <laughs> now, has anybody in this room ever wondered what it was like to be an identical twin? Has anybody ever wondered what that was like? Well, I want you to think about a mirror image for just a second. What did you do this morning with your own mirror image? I had a mirror image that was right there beside me as my alter ego my entire life. But possibly with you this morning, with your own mirror, you got up and did, how many, you fixed your hair and you guys probably combed your mustache or beard and brushed your teeth at least, right? And we women got made sure we got the makeup out behind, underneath our eyes. And if we were walked up to a three-way mirror as we got dressed, how many of you walked up to that three-way mirror, you looked in the mirror, you went like this, and you got out of there as fast as you could? <laughs> how many people did that? Anybody do that? Now, being an identical mirror twin, you walk behind your behind your entire life. <laughs> Can you imagine what it would be like to see your stomach walking across the room? Being an identical twin, you have the rare opportunity to have your consciousness on parade outside of yourself all of the time, and it's like having your consciousness follow you all around. It's an unusual spirit experience. Now, let me add one more piece with this. How many of you have ever had an opportunity to be videotaped? And then they took that videotape. How many people over here? Everybody? Anybody? They took that videotape and they took it back to the class or they took it back to the workshop or they took it back into the organization where you were working on whatever project you were working on. And then they put the videotape up for everyone in the class or in the workshop to watch. How many of you just were scared? How many feel that there should be a law against having to watch <laughs> videotapes of yourself? Shouldn't there be a law against it? And so, uh, you know, what happens in having an identical twin, all the parts that you saw on that videotape that you really loved, see, that's the part of your consciousness, that's the part about you that you want everyone to see. But the parts on that videotape that you didn't like so much that you hoped that, you know, when everybody saw it, you could put your hand over the camera or you could say, I was just kidding, life was rough right then. And you're kind of hoping that they would give you a break, but sometimes it's not quite that easy. Now, being an identical twin, you know, knowing the idea that you're supposed to double your fun and double your pleasure was kind of an interesting thing. And over, for over 30 years in twinning, I found that I actually never had the opportunity to know my own thoughts. I never had an opportunity to know my own feelings, and I didn't really know who I was. And I realized that I had come out of darkness at one point. And there came a point about six years ago that I made the choice that I needed to go back into darkness and detwin. Now, many of us have had to experience some form of darkness, and they don't call it detwinning. They may have called it divorce. 
And divorce is a process that is a wonderful growing experience which we have had to identify and understand the separation process, the identification process, and the maturation process. And only through this growth process do we really find out about who we really are. Now, some people have experienced this separation, identification, and maturation process through death and dying, but only through the process do we really have an opportunity to find out who we really are. But in detwinning, how do you ever really separate from your mirror image? Could you imagine how you could possibly separate from your mirror image? How is it that that part of you that you see on video, how could you leave that part of you behind and start all over again with a brand new image so that everyone would see you differently? How could you separate yourself from your own mirror image, from your own consciousness? Well, I lived in a state of depression, anger, and real frustration for a number of years in going through the separation, identification, maturation process because, and I decided, okay, maybe the best way to do is just get away from my sister and to move completely away from her. Sometimes we try to do that. We like to try to move away from outside experiences. We try to move away from the circumstances knowing that if we can get far enough away from that circumstance that it won't follow us to California. But it does. And I found myself, I was living in Los Angeles, this is about 1985, and I was trying to control that video camera image, I was trying to consult, control the outside circumstances, and I really was angry, I was very upset, I was very confused, I did not know which way to go. And all of a sudden, I met someone and they suggested that I go to a church called the Church of Religious Science, a place where they would combine religion philosophy and psychology. Sounded pretty interesting to me. I wasn't doing speaking at the time, but I was possibly thinking that that might be something I'd like to go do. Now here was a place where they studied a science called the science of mind. I had no idea what it was, but the one thing that really intrigued me was that there was a female minister named Peggy Bassett. And I went and I thought, I'll sit down and go into Huntington Beach and find out a little bit about what she has to say. Now, I can remember on the very first sermon, because I took copious notes, I couldn't believe that there's this outstanding woman standing in front of an entire group of people sharing her thoughts. Because, you know, I'd come from the, uh, the apparel industry, I'd worked with three Fortune 500 companies, and there were not very many women standing out in front of the group. Here was a woman that was quoting Ernest Holmes, and this is what she said. He said, she said, life is a mirror reflecting back to us the conditions which are the images that we hold in our mind. Every thought that we think tends to take form and become a part of our experience, the mirror of our life, the mirror of our mind. He went on to say, fling out the thoughts into the universal intelligence with the assurance of one who knows they are divine and dares to claim all there is. You will find that life will honor that request to the one who knows and acknowledges his divinity. That person becomes a magnet for his good. You mean that I, here I was, trying to control these outside circumstances, the chaos in my life, and what I was really noticing was my own fear in form. And I was beginning to realize I was really out picturing what I was feeling in my thoughts and my feelings. And if I just, here I came to a church that said, if I just changed my mind, I could change my outside experience. That seemed profound to me. Now there was an old Hindu legend that was once told where uh, all the gods had come together and what had happened is, is they had misused their divinity. And in misusing their divinity, they had decided to have a council meeting. And in having this council meeting, they got together and they had all of the lesser gods come together. And the big question was, because they had misused their divinity, was that they made a decision that it was time for them to go out and hide this divinity someplace where man could not find it. And the big question on the council meeting was, where will we hide this divinity? Now, the first council member said to Brahma, he said, where we should hide it is we should dig a very deep hole, and we should bury it deep, deep, deep into the earth. And Brahma says, no, we cannot do that, because over time, man will excavate. He will turn over every rock, every stone, and at some point, he will find his divinity, because he will be looking deep into the earth. 
The second council member said, well, I know what we should do. We should, deep it, we should bury it deep, sink it deep into the sea, way on the ocean bottom. And Brahma said, no, we cannot just sink it. He said, because sooner or later, man will learn how to dive to the ocean depths and will learn how to look over the bottom of the oceans, and he will find that divinity, and he will misuse it again. No, no, that won't work to sink it. Well, the third council member said, well, I think what we should do is climb absolutely the highest mountain, and we should hide it at the very top of the highest mountain. And Brahma said, no, we cannot hide it at the top of the mountain because man will be very clever and very interesting because someday he will learn how to climb to the very top of the highest mountain, and he will find his divinity, and he will misuse it. The entire council gave up, deciding that there was no place for them to be able to hide it. Everyone sat quietly. They meditated for a short time period. And Brahma said to the entire group, he said, Aha, I know where we will hide it. This is a place where man will never, ever look for it. He said, Where we will hide it is deep within himself. You see... Man has been going up and down the earth, climbing, digging, diving, exploring, searching, and he's been looking for something outside of himself that has always been buried deep within himself. Now, I grew up on a farm in Illinois. Anybody else in here a farm person? I feel better already. Good. And the one thing I learned from my father is that when spring came around and it was time for us to plant the spring corn, that if we wanted to harvest corn in the fall, that we had to plant corn in the spring. You see, there was this unusual thing that I found out living on a farm, that you could not plant beans and expect to get corn. But what made the perfection of the harvest really would depend on two things. One, the quality of the seed, and number two, the attention to the growth. And the things that I knew for sure was that I couldn't plant uh, beans and get corn, but my father had to pay very strict to attention to what he was planting. And I think likewise, we must pay, pay real strict attention to the quality of our thoughts, the growth process that we go through, and what we are reaping from those thoughts. See, from the legend, misusing our divinity is when you think that you can plant one thought but reap a benefit of another. Ernest Holmes says, it is impossible for man to conceal himself in any act, word, or gesture. He stands revealed as he is, not as he would like to have himself appear to be. From the universe, there is nothing that can be hidden. The mirror of life cannot help reflecting back to us that which we really believe ourselves to be. Dr. Peggy said, science of mind is the road to freedom and success, but you must pay the price of concentration and study. When you learn that you have the power to change everything about you, including your body, by changing your thoughts, you will cease to worry over the appearance of circumstances. You are not the slave of circumstances, but the creator of your own destiny. Now, to be the creator of our own destiny, first, you must know what you are thinking. And in the separation, sorting, identification process from old beliefs into what you now want to believe into the new beliefs. If you have a pen on, and you have your, your sheet of paper, you might write down the word belief. And then scratch off the first two letters and the last two letters and circle the three letters left in the middle. And what do you have? A lie. Because in the middle of all beliefs is a lie. And when you choose to create a new belief, we may have to realize that accentuating the positive means that we have to focus on a new affirmation that may not feel like a truth, but believing is seeing. It's not seeing, is believing. I somehow found out that through the separation, identification, and maturation <coughs> process, it was so confusing for my, me, myself, that someone told me when I was living in Los Angeles that to learn the separation, identification, and maturation process that's important to teach what you need to learn. And so I, I developed a training which I call Conditions of Deliverance. And in that training, I like to use a lesson which I call the Law of Seven, which I'd like to share with you. And there are seven laws that will deliver you into your personal power, which will uh, deliver you into your own personal divinity so that you can co-create your life. 
Law number one is when we, we basically are beginning to wake up and realize that we need to make a change. That's usually when we're at a state of consciousness of when we're saying, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know what I don't know. I don't know what I don't know about science of mind. I don't know what I don't know about going to work tomorrow on this new job, on this new project. I don't know what I, what I don't know about being a public speaker. I don't know what I don't know about giving my first sermon. I don't know what I don't know. And when you don't know what you don't know, it is called a state of insanity. <laughs> it is also being a virgin on a project. So virginity, I guess, does relate to some form of insanity. <laughs> now law number two says I'm ready to move out of insanity I'm ready to no longer be a virgin on this particular project so that means that you're going to go out and face off with your fear no matter how afraid you might be because fear is false evidence appearing real but fear in form shows up in many forms because we mirror it out to other people and they project our fear directly back to us and there it is fear in form so law number two is when you now have done whatever you're afraid of and you've now done it one time and now you say this to yourself oh now I know what I don't know oh now I know what I don't know about doing da 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 Oh, now I know what I don't know about giving a sermon at the Science of Mind Church. Oh, now I know what I don't know about da da da. And when you know what you don't know, it can create a very overwhelming feeling because you now know what you don't know. And when you know what you don't know, you're no longer insane. Now you're just depressed. <laughs> it's true. But see, understanding the individualization, the maturation, the separation process, in understanding this sense of insanity and depression, depression, confusion, frustration, it's all a natural part of the process. But how many people fight that natural part of the process and they want to fix immediately and we're only on step two, we're only on law number two. And that, you know what happens? At this point, when there's overwhelming feeling comes over, they begin to ask this question, what's wrong? They ask what's wrong, and then they go and talk about what's wrong to their therapist. They talk about what's wrong to their friends and to their family. They talk about what's wrong on the street corner. They talk about what's wrong to anyone who will listen, especially if they can get on the Oprah Winfrey show. <laughs> Now what happens is we have to look at that like the Hindu legend and the farmlands of the Midwest, the laws of compensation will not allow us to sow thoughts, not only sow thoughts, speak thoughts, think thoughts, act thoughts. We cannot sow thoughts of one kind and reap the fruits of another. Another question that might be when we're feeling totally frustrated, which would be law number two, would be what's right. What's right with me? What strengths do I really have? Where are my inner strengths? Where is my divinity? How can I tap into myself? Now law number three is when you're feeling overwhelmed it is time to stop and it's time to go within and it's time to determine what you don't know. And I suggest that in step number three you make an I don't know list. And this I don't know list could be laborious. I don't know how to speak. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to run a, a computer. I don't know how, whatever it is that you don't know, you make that into an I don't know list. Now, true, that might feel overwhelming, depressing, frustrating, angry, upsetting, all of those negatives, but that's a natural process. We know that at this time. But what you want to do with that list is then become proactive and you go from I don't know into making that list your to-do list. And then it is important to prioritize that list of what you're going to do first. Where will you focus your energy? Because whatever you focus will grow. And focusing on law number four. And law number four is determine what do I really want. And don't settle for less. How many people got the opportunity to watch the movie Thelma and Louise? It's a good, it's a really funny movie. And Thelma said to Louise, she said, make sure that you are noticing what you want because you get in life what you settle for. You see, 
we have to know what we want and knowing what you want means that you have to use your body you have to use your mind and your imagination imagine past all limitations and it takes tremendous amount of courage it takes your heart it means that you have to listen to what your heart is singing to you and not believe in outside circumstances because that is only fear in form it is important to realize that action needs to take place and, and the ambition who's really going to move us out of our our mediocrity the toughest crowd to really grow out of is the one at the bottom and you know what there's a lot of room at the top there is so much room at the top and I remember my first mentor when I was living in Los Angeles because when I got into doing speaking and started doing training I wanted to save the world when I started studying science of mind I had so many good ideas I wanted to share with everybody and share everybody and save everybody and what I found was is I was always leaning down and trying to reach up and trying to bring people up to my level and my mentor said this to me she said Jane she said always take one hand and reach down to people who possibly might be below you but the other hand has to be reaching up and if the people below you don't want to come to a new level you bring your hand up and move up because there's people above you who want to bring you along so know what you want but it means that you have to use your imagination your courage and your ambition law number five is find a naturalist a mentor a coach a role model or a guru you might want to write down that word guru g-u-r-u and i think it's interesting because you might be sitting next to a guru right now you might just take a look at the people that are sitting next to you just notice if you're sitting next to a guru because if you notice the way that is spelled guru is spelled g-u-r-u in other words, a guru, when you're going through a change, is a person who reminds you that, gee, you are you and you're not anybody else. And thank goodness you are you. Because we understand what it takes to go through the separation, the identification, and the maturation process. And thank goodness you're assisting me and showing me the way. Because there might be a day that I might be a virgin again at something. <laughs> and then, number six is... Practice your new skills. Practice becoming the image that you want. And in practicing, you want to practice on a low risk, in a low risk territory, and then move to a higher risk. And practice on low risk people, and then move to higher risk. Now, low risk people are usually under the age of five, and they don't belong to you. <laughs> now, law number seven is go teach someone else what you think you know now when you go teach someone else what you think you know you find out right now what you do know and what you don't know and immediately it gives you instant feedback on how much more learning you might need to know and where you might have to go out and find another guru you might have to go find another coach because you now have a, a longer list of things that you may need to go and work on for yourself so go teach someone else now these laws have been taught to me by some very powerful women over the last five or six years and I've had some great mentors that have come through the Church of Religious Science and uh, throughout my travels over the last six years and one story and one person I want to tell about in particular was a woman I met right here in Utah and her name was Jenny and this woman was a naturalist she was out and she took people out into outdoor trainings and she was a wilderness woman now this is a woman that I met her and she had told me about the time when she had just come off of a three-day pack trip pack trip and as she was coming back off of this three-day pack trip she had said that she had experienced a very unusual experience on this three-day trip on the first day of her pack trip she had taken her horse up onto the side of this mountain she had ridden into this meadow and into this meadow she saw a large barnyard and in the middle of this barnyard, there was a, a whole group of clucking chickens in this barnyard. Lots and lots of chickens in this barnyard. And in the middle of this barnyard was a full-grown eagle. Now, this seemed rather peculiar to this woman. And she thought it was unusual that there would be an eagle pecking chicken seed with the chickens. So she decided to walk into the barnyard, walk into the chicken coop to find the barnyard keeper. 
And she walked in and she said uh, to the barnyard keeper, she said, excuse me, sir. She said, did you know that you have a full grown eagle in the middle of your barnyard plucking at chicken feed with all of the chickens? And you know, this barnyard keeper looked back and he said, yeah, because I know that. He says, uh, that's Matilda. She's a fine bird, but just a little confused. She says, uh, you see that she, there was an eagle's egg out by our front gate, and there was a chicken, one of her hens, sat on her, and she hatched into our barnyard. And Matilda thinks she's a chicken, <laughs> and a chicken she will be. Now, this really disturbed Jenny, because she said to this barnyard keeper, she said, but, but this chicken has the heart of an eagle. And if it has the heart of an eagle, then it deserves to be in the skies, not on the earth. She said, can I teach, may I teach this eagle how to fly? Now, you know, this barnyard keeper is kind of looking at her and like, you know, this woman's real crazy. She's kind of, you know, she's pretty rough looking around the edges and figuring, well, what the heck, give her a try because she probably won't leave unless we say yes. And so he says, sure, go ahead. So Jenny walks back out into the middle of the barnyard and she picks up Matilda. And she picks up Matilda, she begins to stroke her, and she's just very empowering. And she says, Matilda, you don't even know who you are. You obviously don't realize that you're not a chicken. You are an eagle. You're very different than all of the others around you. You're an eagle. And Matilda kind of grabbed hold of her arm and looked down and, and see, all of a sudden, uh, Jenny had said to Matilda, she says, now, why don't you just spread out your wings a little bit, and why don't you reach out and see if you could fly? And so, uh, you know, Matilda sort of checks out the situation and looks back at Jenny and says, you know, this is, woman is really crazy. Obviously, she doesn't know I am a chicken. Obviously, she doesn't know where I belong. Obviously, she doesn't know where I have a place in my life. And where I belong is down in the barnyard with all of the other chickens. And Matilda jumped down to be with all the other chickens. Well, a few minutes passed, and it, about a couple hours passed, and Jenny decided to uh, rethink her approach. And so she comes back in, and she decides maybe she needs to take Matilda to a higher height. So she climbs with Matilda on her arm up to the top of the house. And she's standing on the roof of the house, and she then says to Matilda, she says, Matilda, look, look up to the skies. She said, you are an eagle. You belong in the skies. You don't belong to the earth. You have the heart of an eagle. You have some very, very special qualities that you haven't even examined yet. She said, now all you have to do is spread out your wings and fly. Now the more Jenny talked, the more afraid Matilda became. Matilda began to hold her breath. She began to hold on tighter and tighter and tighter and would not let go because she knew who she was. She was a chicken. Now she jumped down. And as she jumped down, her wings did go out just a little bit. And for the first time, she got the experience of flight in action. There was a warm breeze, and it felt so nice. But it was something very new that Matilda had never experienced. Now, Jenny, once again, had to refigure her approach. And so she then made the decision on the very next morning that she would take Matilda out of the barnyard and take her with her to the top of a mountain. As they left the barnyard, Matilda's eyes were glued on that barnyard because there were her clucking friends. There was what she knew, and she was leaving it all behind. And as they went up the mountain, you know, Jenny was able to all of a sudden catch a glimpse of two beautiful eagles gliding along, flying loop de loop. And she said, I want to show you everything that an eagle can do on this very day. She said, right there, that is who you are. That's who you were born to be. Now all you have to do when we get to the top of this mountain is to remember what you're seeing right now. Well, they got up to the top of the mountain. And poor little Matilda was looking back to the barnyard, just waiting, just not knowing really what to expect. And when Jenny got off the horse, she pulled out of her saddlebags a small mirror. And she said to Matilda, she said, now take a look at yourself. She said, do you see who you are? She said, do you see that you're much like the eagles above? You're not like the chickens below. And it is time for you to identify who you really are. Now, it was a very 
strange moment when she put that mirror down because all of a sudden what she found was is that as Matilda was having her little talons on her arm, but her arms began to spread out and the sun was shining and they were at the top of this beautiful cliff and Matilda was beginning to relax into who she really was. You see, with a naturalist, with a guru, it makes it so much easier. And all of a sudden, her courage, through her imagination, her courage and her ambition, all of a sudden, with one triumphant swoop, she jumped and she flew into the skies. Now, this is not to say that she did not ever come back to her barnyard to have a nostalgic visit. There's a pretty good chance that she did do that. She was telling me this story. I found that, that I was that chicken that was stuck in my own mental barnyard. And I hadn't become a public speaker, hadn't had a chance to really begin to ask myself the questions to separate, to identify, to mature into my own self of self-expression. And I realized as I listened to that story that Matilda and I were the same. That I had been stuck in my own mental barnyard that it was so much easier and so much more comfortable for me to peck away at the old seeds of consciousness even though they no longer worked, that it was so much easier to be around my clucking friends, so much easier to stay on the lower level than it was to move above who I thought I was. Could that be true for anyone else in this room? You see, I think that when Matilda jumped off that cliff, that I personally could feel myself flying and I realized that looking at the mirror of life was about these three things. Looking into the mirror of life is about trusting yourself. Number two, it's about risking beyond your imagination and number three, it's about accepting a naturalist along the way. I believe that Matilda is living in each one of us, waiting to fly and maybe some of us are getting stuck in our barnyards longer than others, but we all have the true potential to fly.